So let's begin. Uh, welcome to my PhD defense. Today I will be presenting the work I've done during the last three years. Uh, but first of all, I would like to thank the members of uh, my jury for having accepted to review my work, which is entitled Past and Future Evolution of French Alpine Glaciers in a Changing Climate, a Deep Learning, Classic Hydrological Modeling Approach. So to begin with, I will give you, wait, it's not working. To begin with, I will give you some context on what were the, the conditions that led us to start this research work. So why should we care about glaciers or why are glaciers important? So glaciers are known to be the water towers of the world. This means that glaciers are excellent water buffers that release water storage through uh, late summer and early autumn, which are normally the driest and warmest months of the year. And these water resources are very beneficial or play an important role, first of all, for society, which uses it uh, for hydropower production, also for agriculture or irrigation water withdrawal, and then also for uh, cities and industries for uh, water withdrawal. But then again, these water resources are also play an important role for ecosystems because they ensure uh, water quality and biodiversity for both uh, aquatic and non-aquatic communities. They also provide the necessary nutrient fluxes in rivers and they ensure a base flow uh, in rivers through the driest months. But all these relationships are particularly important for the case of the European Alps and the French Alps because glaciers have been interacting with the uh, human society for a long time, which first of all, they have helped to shape Alpine culture where glaciers have become icons of uh, uh, cultural identity. They have also developed important tourism uh, activities uh, with many visitors uh, bringing a lot of income to these uh, regions. And as I said before, they also have shaped, uh, helped to develop important hydropower uh, industries. So for all these reasons, it is very important to anticipate the social and environmental issues that will be derived from glacier retreat. So this is precisely what the Berger project, which is funded by the uh, Région Auvergne Rhône Alpes, aims to do, whose goal is to study the impact of glacier retreat on water resources, but also on aquatic communities living in glacier fed streams in the French Alps. So as I said, my PhD is, is part of this uh, research project. And my contributions to these uh, research projects are twofold. First of all, I, I, I will provide a glacier evolution model, which will allow us to investigate the past and future evolution of glaciers. And then I will also provide a hydrological model which needs to take into account glacier dynamics in order to take into account the effects of future glacier evolution. So first of all, we need a glacier evolution model. In order to do so, we need to understand what is a glacier. So a glacier is a perennial ice mass that forms in cold enough climates and which interacts with the, the climate. It does so through what is called the mass balance, which is the consequence of the mass gain through accumulation from a snowfall or avalanches and the mass loss through ablation through ice melt or calving. And this could be considered the fir first family of processes, but then the other family of processes that inter intervene in glacier evolution is uh, ice flow dynamics, which determines the way ice flows from the accumulation area of the glacier to the ablation area of the glacier via the effects of um, gravity. And this is precisely the interplay of these two main family of processes that determines glacier evolution. And all glacier evolution models need to uh, simulate this. So during the last 10 years, we have seen a great advance in the different approaches and, and, and types of uh, glacier evolution models, which all have these two uh, main components which uh, simulate the, the main processes. And traditionally, they have been approached in more classic ways, including empirical models, parametrized models, process-based models, and even some statistical models. So for the case of my PhD, we aimed at the beginning at using a statistical model, and I started developing these kind of approaches. But as I started increasing in complexity, I soon started like stepping into the realm of machine learning, which could be considered modern statistics. And actually, now with the, the perspective that we have, we can see that we, uh, in the last years, there have been very few uh, um, scientific works, including machine learning in, in, in glaciers. So we can see during the last three years of my PhD, there were uh, almost 
no works related to this. And it's precisely during these last three years that I, I and in this presentation that uh, I will present two uh, um, publications that, uh, that include um, machine learning applied to glacier evolution models, which basically I applied for the Alpine parameterized glacier model, which is a glacier evolution model that I developed from scratch, which will be basically the baseline of all the work of this talk. And this actually provides us the first of the two necessary models for the uh, Berger uh, project, which is a glacier evolution model. So once we have a glacier evolution model, we need a hydrological model. So just to give you some context, a hydrological model basically is a numerical model which allows us to simulate water resources from catchments. So right now in France, there are a variety of hydrological models that approach uh, the representation of glaciers in different ways. There are some hydrological models that do not include uh, glaciers in them. Other uh, glacierized models, uh, uh, hydrological models, sorry, with the inclusion of glaciers have only been applied at a catchment scale. Other hydrological models include glaciers as static ice reservoirs, like the J2K hydrological model, and like the Mordor model, which also in fact includes a, a glacier evolution uh, um, representation of glaciers, but since it is an uh, operational model, it cannot be used for research purposes. And finally, and uh, most recently, the Swiss GSM second hydrological model was applied including glacier uh, evolution and dynamics in the Mont Blanc Massif, but this represents the very first study to do so. So with this, we can see that the state of the art actually doesn't quite well represent glaciers in this type of models. So for the case of my uh, PhD, uh, PhD work, we chose the J2K hydrological model, which as, we, as I mentioned, represents glaciers as static ice reservoirs. So I will be adding glacier dynamics into this model in order to provide the second necessary model for, uh, for this project, which is a hydrological model with glacier dynamics. So now I will briefly go through the three main objectives of this uh, PhD uh, work. The first one, we will wonder if deep learning can be applied to, to, uh, the, to, to glacier evolution modeling. So the first goal would be to apply deep learning to glacier uh, mass balance modeling. Once we'll have this, we'll jump to the second question, which will answer how will French Alpine glaciers evolve through the 21st century. And with these simulations and these results, we'll try to understand what are the benefits of using a nonlinear mass balance model for future glacier projections. And finally, regarding the hydrological part of my PhD, we will wonder if, um, if we actually can model the past and future hydrological contributions of glaciers in glacierized catchments in the French Alps and in order to overcome the limitations that we just talked about, I will introduce glacier dynamics in a large scale hydrological model. So first of all, I will start with the method section in which I'll be talking about deep learning applied to glacier evolution modeling. So as I said, in order to simulate glacier evolution, we need to, to simulate the two main uh, glacier evolution components, which is mass balance and ice dynamics. In order to simulate mass balance, we need mass balance observations. And there are two main ways to, to um, observe a ma glacier mass balance. The first one is the glaciological method, which is the classic method of field uh, measurements. Since this method is very costly, as you can see, there are very few glaciers in the world observed. And in order to illustrate these concepts, I will be referring to this uh, synth synthetic uh, glacierized region in which every single raw represents one glacier and every column represents one year. So for this type of observations, we'd have a, a coverage similar to this with a, normally a good temporal coverage encompassing multiple decades with normally a seasonal or annual temporal resolution. But on the other hand, since we can only measure few glaciers, we have a low spatial coverage. On the other hand, we have a, another main type of uh, um, mass balance observations which come from remote sensing so from airborne or satellite uh, data, which we have an ever increasing number of observations. This type of observations, they have a very good uh, regional coverage. So we can have a, a very dense coverage uh, at the regional level. But on the other hand, they have a multi-annual temporal resolution encompassing multiple years. Luckily, some studies using the end of summer snow light detection, they're starting to bridge this gap. So we're moving from a multi-annual temporal resolution to an annual temporal resolution. So at this point, we can see that 
from observations, we have a, a good coverage in our uh, idealized region, but there are still many blanks in the, in the data set that need to be filled. So this is where our approach comes into play. What we will be performing is a mass balance reconstruction based on deep learning, which is basically a deep artificial neural network that has been encoded into the AppGM glacier evolution model. So what we will be doing is to train the neural network with all these available mass balance data. And with it, we will be performing a nonlinear statistical regression. And whose end goal will be to fill the special temporal gaps in order to reconstruct the full data set. And with this very same model, we'll be also able to produce um, predictions for future periods. So in order to do so, we used the case study uh, with uh, data from the French Alps based on uh, 32 uh, glaciers, which we have annual glacier-wide mass balance data, some with some glaciers starting from 1949, coming from uh, direct observations from the Glacier Climb Observatory, but also uh, remote sensing observations. We also have topographical data uh, that come from multi-temporal glacier inventories. And we also have uh, climate data from climate reanalysis encompassing the last 60 years, and also climate projections that cover the 21st century. So out of all the approaches that I showed before that are used for glacier evolution modeling, why should we use uh, deep learning for mass balance modeling? So the first reason is because deep learning is known to be nonlinear and the climate and glacier systems are also nonlinear. So if we use a nonlinear tool, we'll have a tool that is more adapted to, to uh, simulate this type of systems. Secondly, because deep artificial neural networks also help us to escape the so-called curse of dimensionality. So in high dimensional complex problems like this one, deep artificial neural networks are known to behave better uh, compared to more shallow uh, neural networks or more simple um, statistical methods. Also because we're seeing an increasing number of available data sets and machine learning and particularly deep learning are known to be good at simulating large quantities of data. And finally, and most importantly in my opinion, because they represent an alternative, alternative to empirical or physical classic approaches. It doesn't mean that uh, this, this sort of approach is going to be better, but if we get results with a, an alternative method, you can increase confidence in these results and basically contrast uh, the results and hypotheses from the community. So at this point, I will, I will go through and will give you an overview of the pipeline that I developed in order to create uh, deep learning methods, uh, models uh, to simulate the glacier mass balance. So we have three main phases. The first phase is the design phase in which we will design the, the neural network. Then we'll have to training. And finally, we'll produce uh, the final model that will be used for the actual simulations. So onto the first phase, the design of the artificial neural network. The first thing we need to do is to choose the, the predictors that we want to, to, to use for, this, uh, for these simulations. So in this case, we want to simulate annual glacier-wise ma mass balance. So if we perform a literature review, we'll see that annual glacier-wide mass balance is influenced both by climate, but also topography. So with this, we can already establish a pool of predictors that according to the literature will participate in these processes. And then we can perform a sensitivity analysis in which we will narrow down this list with the predictors that are actually um, uh, important for our very own specific data set. And once we have this, we can start designing the, the architecture of the neural network. So this, at the beginning, it has actually no secret. It's quite empirical and it involves also some trial and error, but we need to come up with an architecture that is not too complex and not too simple. And basically this neural, neural network will take as input the topoclimatic predictors that we have chosen previously, and it will simulate the annual glacier-wide mass balance. And then once we have this, we also need to select the initial hyperparameters that will determine the way the neural network will be trained and will learn. So once we have this draft of the initial architecture of the neural network, we can move to the actual training. And the goal of this will be, first of all, that the neural network learns the patterns in the data, but it should also be capable of extrapolating to unseen data. So in this case, it's unseen glaciers and years. So the goal here will be, again, to uh, ensure the neural network can be applied to unseen uh, 
places in time, so glaciers and period of time. So again, I will be using this synthetic uh, glacierized region to illustrate this. So first of all, we perform a leave one glacier out uh, cross validation in which we remove one glacier, we train with all the rest of the data and we assess the performance on this unseen glacier. Then we iterate it through the full data set in order to assess the, the performance in, the, in all the data set. Then we did exactly the same thing on the temporal dimension, removing single years, uncovering the full data set. And finally, in order to assess the spatial temporal performance, we removed random glaciers and years, and we assess the performance uh, to this uh, hidden data. So the, this actually allows us to fine tune the chosen neural network in order to improve its performance. First of all, we can monitor the performance on each of these faults, so each glacier and year, in order to see how uh, the performance evolve when we, when we change the architecture. We can also adjust the hyperparameters in order to improve the, the, the predictions. And finally, the end goal of this is to assess the performance, the final statistical performance of the model. So in this case, we can get the performance in the uh, spatial dimension, in the temporal dimension, and also in both dimensions at the same time. But the most important result that I want to highlight here is that these training processes with this data set, we produced it exactly the same with another linear machine learning model based on the lasso. And then we compare the performances of these two models and we encountered that using a nonlinear deep artificial neural network, we had over plus 100% of explained variance or almost plus 60% of accuracy. So we're seeing major improvements in terms of performance when moving to a nonlinear mass balance model. And at this point, we're ready to produce the final model that will be used for the, for the final simulations. And what we'll be do, doing here is a cross-validation ensemble approach. So as I said, for these cross-validation approaches, we have one single model for each uh, uh, cross-validation fault. So for each glacier or each year. So what we want to do here is we're gonna simulate the mass balance with each of individual faults, and then we will average all of them in order to produce one single uh, final um, prediction. This has the benefit to reduce overfitting, which helps the model to further generalize. So this was for the part of the mass balance simulation, but actually we want to make the full glacier evolve. So we need to move this to the uh, evolution of, of ice in order to include also what is called the glacier dynamics. So as I said, we have, first of all, the deep learning mass balance component based on the neural network, which we force with high resolution climate data for past and future periods. And then this mass balance is plugged to a glacier geometry update par parameterization. So in order to run this, uh, uh, this component, we need glacier ice thickness data, which is based from Farino et al. 2019, which are basically ice thicknesses simulated for the year 2003, covering the, the whole globe. And we make the glacier evolve using a parameterization of glacier dynamics based, based on the delta H parameterization, where basically we use an uh, individual, individual glacier um, function that we, we computed, where we redistribute the mass balance according to the different glacier altitudes. So at this point, we have developed the, the methods which we presented in, uh, in a publication, where we gave all the, all the details. At this point, we wonder, okay, what, how can we apply this in order to, to show that it works and, and to, 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 to create like a data set of this? So this is exactly what we did. We reconstructed 49 years of mass balance series for all French Alpine glaciers. So here we're moving to the results part where we are applying the methods shown uh, before. So as a reminder, here we are focusing on the Western part of the European Alps, which are the French Alps, which include around 660 glaciers, uh, according to the 2003 glacier inventory. So what we did, we performed an annual glacier-wide mass balance reconstruction on the 661 glaciers. And this is what you can see in this, um, in this graph. Actually, we covered the 1967 to 2015 period. And each individual line that you see here is one individual glacier. And in blue, you can see the area weighted uh, average. So for this period, in cumulative, we encountered that glaciers on average lost 0.69 meter water equivalent per year. And then again, also this, this data set, we compared it to the to observations that we have in the region based on, on glaciological observations and also remote sensing observations. 
and, other, and also other mass balance reconstructions from another study, which helped us to uh, contrast these results. But the end goal of this uh, study was actually to produce an open source uh, data set that can be potentially used for future users for ecological and also, also hydrological studies, which was published in the Earth System Science Data Journal. So now that we have shown the methods and a direct application of, the, uh, of this with the results, we can already answer the first scientific question that we asked at the beginning of this talk, which is, and we can say with this that deep learning can be successfully be applied to model glacier evolution. And if we take, take enough care to thoroughly cross-validate it uh, respecting the spatial temporal patterns, it can be even used uh, with small data sets without overfitting. And then we also found that uh, we have an improved performance over linear machine learning models. Since it's not linear, it has a better representation of nonlinear climate glacier interactions and also that the design of the neural networks give us enough flexibility in order to uh, tackle high dimensional uh, complex regression problems. So at this point, we have applied this uh, methodology for the past, but now we move to a more complex simulations where we'll be simulating the evolution of all the, the glaciers in the French Alps through the 21st century. So what we did here is we used exactly the same glacier model and we forced it with Adamon. Adamon is a high resolution climate data set which is based on Eurocortex and which has been adjusted for mountain areas. It includes 29 future climate uh, projections which cover the three main RCP scenarios that we know. It has RCP 2.6 which is an optimistic scenario which includes uh, a reduction in future greenhouse gases emissions. And it includes RCP scenario 4.5 which is an intermediate scenario and also RCP scenario 8.5 which is a pessimistic scenario in which future emissions will continue increasing. So if we take a look at the results of the, first of all, mass balance simulations, we can see in orange, the average uh, uh, mass balance, uh, regional mass balance evolution under RCP 4.5. And we can see that a mass balance is going, to, uh, is going to remain more or less constant throughout the century, meaning that glacier retreat is going to compensate the warming in the atmosphere. On the other hand, we can see that around the year 2050, differences between the two uh, RCP scenarios are going to, to become uh, clear. And under RCP 8.5, by the end of the century, we're going to have uh, mass balances that are going to, be, going to be almost twice as negative as at the beginning of the century. If we take a look, actually we have 13 scenarios, uh, climate scenarios that cover these two RCPs. And then if we look at RCP 2.6, we have three scenarios that cover this, uh, this um, RCP. And we can actually see that under this optimistic scenario, glaciers won't even be capable of uh, regaining equilibrium with the climate by the end of the century. So they will still be uh, retreating uh, by then. So this allows us to, to see uh, um, the evolution in, in uh, ice volume through the century. And with this, we can estimate that in the most optimistic scenario, glaciers are going to lose around 75 of, of their initial ice, thing, uh, ice, uh, ice volume. And in the most pessimistic scenario, they're going to lose around 88% of their current uh, volume. So independently from future emissions or future climate scenarios, most of the ice in the French Alps is estimated to be lost. Then if we look at the actual ice uh, volume di distribution under an intermediate scenario of RCP 4.5. In this map, we can see, first of all, the size of the circles, which indicates the current ice volume in 2015, and the color, which indicates the remaining fraction by the end of the century. So uh, ranging between the clearest one, which is 25%, and the darkest one, which is 0%. So first we, we can see is that currently, the Mont Blanc Massif amasses around 60% of the, of the total ice volume. So the ice distribution is highly heterogeneous. But then if we look at the colors, we see that by the end of the 21st century, only glaciers in the Mont Blanc area and in the Pelvou area in the Ecran region are going to remain. The rest are going to mostly 100% disappear or only have some, some, some remnants. And then if we perform a zoom in the Mont Blanc uh, region, which is the the most glacierized uh, um, region in the French Alps, 
we can see that if we look at the colors, the, the light uh, yellow color indicates the glacier extent forecasted by the end of the century. And we can see that most ice is located around the highest summits. So what we did is we performed a statistical analysis based on these topographical descriptors of glaciers. And we concluded that a large high altitude accumulation basin determines glacier survival in the French Alps. So glaciers with large air and sur uh, surface areas at high altitudes have more chances to survive the warming on the 21st century. So at this point, we had a nice data set of future glacier evolution simulations. And we decided to use it to analyze the role of nonlinear climate glacier interactions. So actually, this glacier evolution model gives us a nice opportunity to uh, analyze the, the effect of nonlinearities because we can easily switch between the two mass balance models. So we basically we perform simulations, first of all, with the nonlinear mass balance model based on deep learning, and then we perform simulations based on the linear mass balance model based on the lasso. And what we did is we kept the rest of the parameters of the model um, the same, and we trained these two mass balance models exactly with the same data. So in order to isolate, isolate the effects of uh, mass balance nonlinearities. So what we did is we compared the reactions or the response of the, of the mass balance models with respect to the three main climate mass balance drivers, which are, first of all, air temperature, winter snowfall, and also summer snowfall. So the first thing we can see here is that the purple line, which indicates the linear mass balance model, reacts linearly to climate forcings. And on the other hand, the green line, which represents the deep learning nonlinear mass balance model, reacts nonlinearly. Around zero anomalies, so the intermediate values, the reaction of the two models is, is rather similar, but as we approach extreme anomalies or extreme forcings, differences start to be more important, as we can see here. So at this point, we wondered, okay, since we're seeing differences between a linear mass balance model and a nonlinear mass balance model, how does this affect future simulations? This is what we tried to assess in this part of the results. So what we did is we compared the future simulations using the deep, lear deep learning nonlinear mass balance model against the linear mass balance model based on the lasso. So what we see here is that from the second part of the century, we can see already that the differences start to arise and where the nonlinear mass balance model gives more negative mass balance rates, particularly under RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5. If we take a look in cumulative terms, we can see that these differences remain the same with nonlinear mass balance models giving more negative rates than linear mass balance models. So what we, uh, we might wonder, what is the origin or the source of these differences? So if we take a look at the PDFs, we can see that first of all, under RCP 2.6, the dashed line, which represents the linear lasso uh, mass balance model, gives positive mass balance rates by the end of the century, meaning that glaciers with a linear mass balance model reach equilibrium by the end of the century. Whereas with a nonlinear mass balance model, glaciers are not capable of reaching equilibrium. So here we see a main difference. And on the other hand, under the most pessimistic climate scenario, RCP 8.5, we see the opposite, that the um, continuous line, which is the nonlinear mass balance model, gives more negative mass balance rates than the dashed line, which is the, the linear model. So for the specific case of the French Alps, if we take a look at the cumulative uh, results here, we can see that actually differences are not that big. We have maximum and cumulative around 16% of, uh, of differences. But here we can see the cumulative uh, mass balance projections with uh, under the three main RCPs with the dashed lines, which uh, um, represent the linear mass balance model and the continuous lines that represent the nonlinear mass balance model. And as I said, these differences here are not very marked. So in cumulative, we cannot, we cannot see important differences, but actually we need to remember that here, these results have been made with a very small geographical um, area. And since these uh, differences come from extreme climate forcings, we argue that since in the world there are 
many different glacial ice regions with different climates and glaciological configurations, this uh, difference, uh, this, this, the impact of uh, extreme climate forces on nonlinearities might play an important role potentially to other glacial ice regions. So we'd like to highlight the fact that glacier mass balance nonlinearities might potentially impact future estimates of sea level rise. So at this point, with the results, we can already answer the second scientific question that we asked at the beginning of this talk, which is how will French Alpine glaciers evolve through the 21st century? So we saw that the French Alpine glaciers are expected to lose with, uh, between 75% in the most optimistic scenario and 88% in the most pessimistic scenario by the end of the 21st century. And also that most precisely, only glaciers in the high altitude Mont Blanc and Pulvou massifs are expected to survive by the end of the century under an intermediate scenario. And then when we analyzed these future simulations uh, and we analyzed the role of uh, linear, uh, linear mass balance models and nonlinear mass balance models, which allowed us to conclude that nonlinear mass balance models uh, allow us to, to have an improved representation of extreme climate glacier responses, which consequently, consequently uh, allows us to reduce uncertainties in long-term mass balance and also sea level rise uncertainties due to the fact that uh, climate forcing includes nonlinearities. And finally, we argue that uh, more research would be needed to, to study the, the, the actual effect of, of mass balance nonlinearities. And since this has only been applied to a small uh, glacialized region, applying this sort of analysis to more key glacialized regions which contribute more to sea level rise would be important. And also this, would, this type of analysis would be interesting, interesting to, to be included in, in large scale studies such as glacier meat. So at this point, I conclude with the uh, part of the results dedicated to purely to glaciers. And now we'll be moving to glacier hydrological modeling applied in the French Alps. So as a reminder, um, here, what we intended to do is we had a hydrological model that didn't include uh, glacier dynamics in it. So the role here was to try to improve the representation of glaciers in this hydrological model. So what we were do doing here is we will be using a case study, which we'll be using as a proof of concept. Since we had some time constraints here, the main objective of this, of this part will be to implement uh, technically this, um, this, uh, um, this re dynamic representation of glaciers in the hydrological model in order for this model to be directly applicable in large scale uh, studies in mountain glacierized catchments. So what we did is we chose the Arvan catchment, which is located not far away uh, here from Grenoble, which has around 60 uh, square kilometers and includes the saint sorlin glacier uh, in the southwestern part which covers more or less 3.5% of the total surface. So the reason we chose um, this catchment was that we have a lot of available data. First of all, we have uh, a lot of data from the San Saulan Glacier since it has been monitored for many years by the Glacier Claim Observatory. We have mass balance data, but also ice thickness uh, data. We have a gauging station at the outlet of the, of the catchment. And we also have two sources of climate reanalysis covering the last decades. So as a reminder, here we chose the J2K hydrological model, which is a distributed process-based open source hydrological model. It is this, uh, developed by the University of Vienna in Germany, and it has many international uh, users and developers with studies applied in, in Nepal and France and in other countries. So as a reminder, uh, the main drawback that we had for the application in the case of this uh, research project was the fact that glaciers are represented as static ice reservoirs. So the main goal here will be to add glacier dynamics into the J2K hydrological model. So how did, how did I do it? Uh, basically, I developed uh, a Python package which was uh, released in a separate uh, repository called Glaciers to J2K, which, whose main role was to read prescribed annual glacier extents from an external um, glacier uh, model, which in this case was, was the AlpGM glacier mo model in order to compute the overlap between the, the extent of the hydrological model and the glacier model. 
So the main reason for this is that the, um, the, the catchment in the J2K hydrological model is distributed in HRUs, which are hydrological response units. And these are actually static in time. They, they are set at the beginning of the simulations, but they cannot evolve. So in this case, we see that the glacier is covered by four different HR, HRUs, which cannot evolve in time. So uh, in order to bypass this limitation on the model, what we did is with an annual time step, we compute the overlap for each one of the HRUs with the actual annual extent of the glacier, giving us the glacierized fraction and the non-glacierized fraction. This has the advantage that it can also be applied. It can also re read the outputs of other um, glacierized uh, gl glacier evolution models, giving a lot of flexibility to be applied with multiple hydrological and also uh, glaciological models. And the, the goal of this package basically is to, it computes these uh, glacierized and non-glacierized fractions, and then it interpolates them with an annual time step, which is suitable for the hydrological model. And then this interpolation is made throughout the ablation season in order to reproduce a realistic uh, glacier evolution uh, uh, behavior. And this is stored in a file, which can be read by the, by the J2K hydrological model, which is stored in separate repository and for which we updated an already existing glacier module. And by reading this file, the hydrological model is capable of correctly scaling the runoff uh, from the glacier and the runoff from the non-glacierized parts. So this was quite a complex uh, technical implementation and that will be soon uh, pushed to the, to the centralized repository for the hydrological model. And the next step, once we have the evolution of glaciers in the hydrological model, we need to calibrate its mass balance uh, model. So in the, for the case of the J2K model, it uses a classic temperature index model, which we calibrated with uh, mass balance observations from the Glacier Clean Observatory. So due to time constraints, we only um, calibrated three parameters manually, which were a nice melt factor, a snow melt factor, and a precipitation scaling factor to be applied only over the glacier. As you can see here, the results were more or less satisfactory, but the, the internal variability was not super well reproduced. We managed to have a very good um, um, behavior in terms of summer mass balance through the ice melt factor, but the winter mass balance was more problemat problematic to reproduce, particularly because we had to uh, increase precipitation on the glacier by 70%, and also since uh, we didn't have much time by, by, by calibrating manually, uh, we were limited in these terms. And then, but still like with this um, rather quick uh, um, um, implementation in this uh, case study, we can see that we already see some, some benefits in the hydrograph where we can see that for the annual, the, the average monthly um, runoff, in black, we can see the observations at the gauging station. In orange, we can see the hydrological model without the glacier. And in blue, we can see the hydrological model with the glacier. So we can see that by in including the glacier module, we start to better reproduce the typical tail of late summer and early autumn uh, runoff. But actually what we argue is that an automatized parameter calibration is certainly needed in order to, first of all, improve uh, the quality of the simulations, but most importantly, it, it will be needed when moving to, to large scale simulations at the uh, catchment scale. For example, like the Rhone uh, catchment for the case of the Berger project. So at this point, we are already capable of answering the third and last scientific question of, of this PhD work, where we show that actually hydrological models in France have some limitations regarding the representation of glaciers. And in order to overcome this, we chose the J2K hydrological model for which we introduced glacier dynamics. This, this allowed us to provide the technical means for this model to be capable to be applied in large scale hydrological model simulations in the French Alps for the case of the Berger project, but hopefully also in other glacierized regions in the world. So at this point, I will conclude uh, this work and I will also give some perspectives on future venues uh, from, from this uh, research uh, results. So first of all, in order to summarize, we show that deep learning can su successfully be applied to large scale glacier evolution modeling. Uh, with this, we developed the first glacier evolution model ever to exploit uh, deep learning. 
we applied, um, we, we showed that, the, that since deep learning is not linear, it shows quite a lot of advantages when simulating, uh, when applying it to, to simulate the nonlinear climate and glacier systems. And then we applied this methodology to simulate the past and future evolution of French Alpine glaciers from the late 60s to the end of the 21st century. And then, on the other hand, regarding the hydrological, hydrological part of my PhD, we, we saw that there were some limitations in hydrological models in France, and we overcame these limitations by adding glacier dynamics in, in uh, the J2K model, which with this we, we presented a proof of concept in a, in a case study based on a glacierized catchment, and this gave the technical means for this large scale, uh, for, for this hydrological model to be applied on large scale hydro, glacial hydrological studies. So, um, so far I have shown what worked, but uh, I've encountered also many challenges and, and difficulties that I learned from, from the many mistakes I did during these three years, which I will highlight two of them. The first one is uh, that actually modeling annual glacial wide mass balance is very tricky. We chose annual glacial ice mass balance because we have a lot of data um, from this, uh, with this type of mass balance observations. But first of all, uh, unlike point mass balance, it includes complex topographical feedbacks that uh, com further complicate uh, the simulations. And also, since it's annual glacial ice mass balance, it lacks the accumulation and ablation, but also the seasonal components, which when we move to hydrological modeling, the, the, these components are uh, very necessary to, to calibrate the models. And then most importantly, since the uh, deep learning approach that we use uh, in, this, uh, in this study was virtually a black box model, inference is not possible with uh, this current approach, meaning that we, can, we cannot actually understand what is exactly happening inside the model. So in order to overcome this, I will give you some perspectives on how we intend to continue this work in order to, to, uh, to overcome these limitations. First of all, I would like to add physics into neural networks. So what, what does it mean? I would like to represent glacier processes as differential equations, which with a representation of glacier mass balance and ice flow dynamics, and then to optimize the unknowns of these differential equations of glacier processes with neural networks. So this will allow us, first of all, to calibrate a model based on observations and to perform simulations with this model, but then also, with this, we could gain new knowledge on glacier processes and to gain this knowledge through mathematical representations, which could give us updated equations of these glacier processes. And finally, it has a, another virtue, which is that it re reduces our dependency on data. But since we are constraining the learning with uh, physical priors, we require less data, which in glaciology, we never seem to have enough data. Also, I would like to use the convolutional neural networks, which have seen a lot of success in imagery, and, but also computer vision. And for the case of this project, I would like to use them to exploit uh, the spatial information in raster data. First of all, because it would allow me to work with point mass balance data, leaving behind the studies with uh, glacier wide mass balance data. And they would also be allow me to apply them to ice thickness data to include ice flow dynamics in the model. Then, we would also like to use global data sets to move the model at a large scale application. First of all, using global ice surface velocities, global genetic uh, glacier mass balances covering the whole globe, and also the soon to be released uh, uh, new version of the Randolph Glacier Inventory. And finally, I would also try to explore the possibility to integrate this research into the OGGM model. First of all, because I believe it's a great, great open source platform for glacier modeling, which could allow me to, to code and to present this work in a more accessible way for the community and also to potentially foster new users in the future. It will also allow me to reuse the main core components, saving me some uh, uh, coding and developing time. And the goal will be to try to add this new research as new mass balance and ice dynamics components that could be optionally plugged in the model. So in order to do so, I've written a postdoc research proposal called Understanding and Predicting Glacier Evolution with Interpretable Physics Informed Neural Networks, in which I try to uh, present this work and which I'm also trying to get funded. So if anybody is interested by this and wants to give me some money, I would be happy to talk to them. And um, at this point, I only have left to say that 
first of all, I would like to thank my supervisor for all these um, marvelous uh, three years. Antoine, Isabel, and Eric, because it has been an absolute pleasure to work with them. And I hope I can continue doing so in the future. And I think I also would like to uh, thank my collaborators, which have helped me and I've learned a lot from them in the publications and throughout the, the whole research pro uh, process. And then also a great deal of people that indirectly in many different ways, they have also influenced me and supported me during these three years. So really a lot of thanks to everyone because this has really been a, a collective effort. And yeah, thank you a lot for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, now we'll stop the, the streaming. Thank everyone for coming.